Hello, everyone. Happy is the person who loves their profession, for it cannot be changed quickly. And as a rule, what you choose in your youth will become your main profession. I, like some of you, am an exception, having chosen other professions, but electronics, which was always a hobby, became my main source of income. I have YouTube, my wonderful audience, and that's everything to me. I love this work because there are no limitations here. There are many directions, an insatiable desire to learn new things, and in the end, it's incredibly interesting. In many cases, you don't choose the profession, chooses you. Lately, I've become interested in electric transport and batteries, tested a bunch of varieties, assembled many batteries for different tasks, recorded a lot of videos, and got my first clients. However, I don't want to assemble batteries on a production line and do it purely because it's a kind of relaxation for me. I love sitting in spot welding cells for hours. By the beginning of spring 2024, I assembled a battery for a Courier electric scooter. And not just any battery, but a lithium, iron phosphate one with 48 volts and 24 amp hours. The coolest part is that this battery charges in just an hour. The owner has been using it for several months now, and he really likes it. So much so that he ordered a second battery for me for another identical scooter he owns. The main focus when assembling the battery was on compact size, a capacity of 40 amp hours or more, and of course safety. Lithium ion sells 18,650 Indian rupees 26E with a capacity of 2.6 amp hours, were chosen as they are the most affordable, and time tested. I've been using these cells for a long time and have no complaints. In addition, this is the most cost-effective solution considering the specifications, which are quite good. The claimed lifespan is 1,000 cycles. This means even with daily charging and discharging about 3 years of life. The internal resistance is only 16 to 17 milliohms, and they are high current with a continuous discharge current of 5 C or 13 amps. The form factor is 18650. The battery, as I mentioned, is 48 volts. This means it requires a 13S configuration. Next, I estimated the dimensions, and it became clear that each parallel can use 16 cells, which, considering the capacity of one at 2.6 amp hours, will give us a total of almost 42 amp hours of capacity. In the end, the project will use 208 of such cells, and the total weight of the battery will be about 10 kilograms. At the very beginning, the voltage and internal resistance of all 208 cells were measured. The maximum variation in resistance is only within 1 milliohm, which is negligible. The factory voltage is perfectly consistent at 2.59 volts, with a variation in the thousandths of a volt. That's why I value this manufacturer. Such a consistent charge indicates minimal self-discharge and high cell quality. There's no point in checking the capacity, as I've been working with these cells for quite some time. I have tested them repeatedly and thoroughly. Their capacity ranges from 2.6 to 2.75 ampere hours. Later, additional paper insulators were glued to the positive terminals of the cells, and then I proceeded with the assembly. It's important to note that I will not be using holders. Unfortunately, with them, I cannot meet the technical specifications for size. And since there are no holders, more attention needs to be paid to safety, as the cells are in close proximity. The battery will be two-tiered. The first tier has 108 cells, the second has 100 nickel-plated strips with a thickness of 0.15 and widths of 8 and 10 millimeters were used to connect the cells. In some places, multiple layers of strips were used to increase the connection's throughput. Of course, a draft is first created on paper, and not just one. Batteries are always different, and you need to think a lot before starting assembly to get the most optimal connection combination. Next, the batteries need to be connected. I do this using the spot welding method on a capacitor-based device, which I have modified to work with strips up to 0.35-0.04 millimeters after modification. First, parallels of 16 cells are assembled. Then these assemblies are connected in series. The process takes a lot of time because first you need to cut a lot of nickel-plated strips. Then, weld it all together. In general, you need nerves of steel. It should be noted here 
that to increase vibration resistance, all the cells were glued together with B7000 adhesive. Next, all the parallels were insulated from each other with thin fiberglass laminate, with additional insulation of captain in some places. In the end, we get two beautiful assemblies that need to be connected in series. Between them, there are two layers of laminate insulation, and the laminate is glued. After the main block was ready, I welded the signal strips, where the wires from the BMS are connected for monitoring the parallels. It is also important to note that there is insulation in all the tap-off points. Captain, insulating paper, and laminate. In low current circuits, this acts as an electrical insulator, while in high current circuits, in addition to electrical insulation, it prevents heat transfer to the cells in case of power connection overheating. Since it is possible that in some cases, the power strips may heat up and melt the cell insulation. Such an outcome is impossible during normal operation, but extra safety never hurts. The BMS board is solid and sealed. It's a symmetrical BMS with a passive balancing function. Rated for 40 amps discharge and 20 amps charge. It provides protection against short circuits, overcharging, deep discharge, and overheating. In this project, an active balancer will not be used as it was in the previous one because there's no particular sense in it. The battery is capacious and will be regularly in use, possibly for two shifts a day, and no balancer would have time to do anything. But considering that the cells are good, there shouldn't be any significant issues with imbalance, at least for the next couple of years. The wires from the BMS are 10 AW, and for all other connections, I used either 4x16 AW or 2x12. All the wires are flexible with silicone heat resistant insulation. The signal wires from the BMS are neatly arranged, with plenty of insulation underneath them everywhere, and all connections are taped and additionally insulated. To secure everything that might be damaged due to vibrations, a neutral silicone sealant with a non acidic base was used. There is a large 70 amp fuse on the positive power line. This is additional protection in case of an emergency and the electronic short circuit protection on the BMS board fails. In such cases, the fuse will save the day. The BMS temperature sensor is tucked away deep inside the battery. Before the final assembly, of course, the battery needs to be thoroughly tested. For this, I first charged the battery to a voltage of 54.6 volts. I didn't skimp on the discharge and immediately loaded it with large currents of 20 to 27 amps, although it can handle up to 40. The discharge setup consists of a powerful rheostat, a fan that blows on it to prevent overheating, and a battery monitor that displays all the processes current, voltage, consumed capacity, temperature, and more. On this monitor, I set the capacity to 100 amp hours. We discharged the battery until the BMS triggered at the lower voltage threshold. Next, we'll record the residual capacity on the monitor. Subtract the residual from the set 100 amp hours to get the actual capacity of our battery. The monitor's temperature sensor is attached to the BMS and shows its temperature. A multimeter data logger is connected in parallel to the battery, which monitors the battery voltage in recording mode. It will allow us to see the BMS trigger voltage at the lower threshold. From time to time, I monitor the overall battery temperature with an IR thermometer. As a result, the temperature throughout the discharge process was within 40 degrees Celsius, and at the end, we see a residual capacity value of 56.5 ampere hours on the monitor. Subtracting this number from the initial 100, we get a battery capacity of about 43 and a half ampere hours. The discharge graph looks as follows. The voltage at which the BMS cutoff was triggered was about 37 volts. Next, I fully charged the battery and measured the voltage across the parallels. After ensuring everything was even, I began the final assembly of the battery. I wrap the cells on all sides with thick double-sided adhesive tape, which acts as a damper. On top of the damper, a thin fiberglass sheet is added for rigidity. Next, a large heat shrink sleeve with a diameter of 40 centimeters was purchased. And then I spent a long time carefully shrinking it onto the battery. All the gaps were sealed with glue and sealant. In some places, it didn't turn out very aesthetically pleasing, but it's reliable, and the appearance doesn't affect the performance at all. In the end, Labels with specifications and hazards were printed on a printer 
and after laminating them, I attach them to the battery. There is also an NFC tag that links to this video, or rather to the main channel, since at the time of handing over the battery to the owner, this video had not yet been created, and accordingly was not recorded on the tag. There's also an improvised handle here. It is made of several layers of strong tape with fiberglass reinforcement. It allows for transporting this kind of weight without any issues and even much more. Practically takes up no space. The power connector is very reliable, Antispark XT90. The cost of this battery is $630. That's exactly how much the owner paid as of June 2024. Convert to another currency yourself. In conclusion, I want to note once again that I do not engage in assembling. Lately, many viewers have been writing with requests to assemble this or that battery. Firstly, I work alone and can't keep up with the demand. Secondly, this is a hobby for me. And thirdly, I live in another country. So please do not write with battery orders. And with that, this video comes to an end. All necessary links, including links to my other resources, can be found in the description. Well, that's all from me. As always, this was Kazinov Ka with you, and see you next time. Goodbye.